The second type of tissue we're going to look at is connective tissue. This tissue is found throughout the body and its primary function is to bind, connect, and support. As you can see from the chart on this slide, there are several different categories of connective tissue found in the body and then subcategories below each. We'll go into the different types over the next few slides, but you might find it useful to create this diagram for yourself as a graphic organizer. When it comes to learning about connective tissue for the test, you should focus on knowing the names of the different types. First, we have loose fibrous connective tissue. As you can see from the diagram, these cells are very loosely packed together and they're running every which way with no sense of organization. You find this type of connective tissue underneath the skin and also throughout the body cavities where it works to hold tissues and organs in place. You can think of this tissue as acting like filler. It's almost like the newspaper or packing peanuts you would add to a package before sending it in the mail. Closely related to loose fibrous connective tissue is dense fibrous connective tissue. Before I continue, please note that you should check this portion of your notes. There was originally a typo in the student notes provided. If the words in red on the screen are still in your notes, please take a moment to remove them as they refer to a previous slide. You should be able to see a difference here between the dense fibrous connective tissue on this screen and the loose fibrous connective tissue from the previous screen. These fibers are much more organized, often in parallel formation, which gives the tissue much more strength. Examples of dense fibrous connective tissue include tendons, a type of tissue that connects muscles and bones, and ligaments, a type of tissue that jo joins bone to bone. The third type of connective tissue is called adipose tissue, which is also known as fat. You can see that these cells are large and round. If you look closely, you can see how the nuclei have been pushed to the sides of the cell, which allows more room for fat storage. Adipose tissue has several essential roles in the body. First, it can act as a form of stored energy. It is also important because it insulates the body and provides a protective covering around the organs. The fourth type of connective tissue is blood. Some people actually consider blood to be an entirely different type of tissue altogether, calling it vascular tissue. But for the purpose of our course, we will consider blood to be connective tissue. Blood is made up of red blood cells and white blood cells suspended in a fluid called plasma. We'll learn more about the structure of blood in Unit 2. The main function of blood is to carry materials such as oxygen, nutrients, and wastes throughout the body as well as helping with immune functions, such as fighting off infections. The fifth type of connective tissue is called cartilage, and you can see from the diagram that these cells are embedded in a strong, rubbery material. You find cartilage in places like your ears and nose. You can feel that this cartilage is fairly strong, but it's also flexible and has some give to it. With the sixth type of connective tissue, you can see that we have moved towards an even stronger material, which is bone. The cells of bone, like cartilage, are also embedded in a material, but this time the material also includes calcium and collagen fibers. From the diagram, you can see how organized the cells, fibers, and salts are, which lends strength to the structure. This material forms our skeleton, which provides a rigid framework for our whole body. Before moving on to the next type of tissue found in the body, let's do a quick recap of the six types of connective tissue. Loose fibrous connective tissue, dense fibrous connective tissue, adipose tissue, blood, cartilage, and bone. Remember, connective tissue binds, supports, and protects our bodies. The third type of tissue found in the body is muscle tissue. You probably already have a general sense of what muscles do in the body. They are, of course, responsible for movement. Muscle tissue is made up of long fibers which contain actin and myosin, proteins that are able to shorten or contract and lengthen or relax. Not all types of muscle look exactly like the diagram provided on this slide, but you can see here the alternating light and dark bands. These bands are actin and myosin, organized in a way that allows for contraction and relaxation. There are three types of muscle found in the body, which we'll learn about in this lesson and then see throughout the rest of the course. 
Skeletal muscle is probably the type of muscle tissue that you think about when you think about muscle. This is the type of muscle that is attached to your skeleton and allows you to flex your bicep or jump on one foot or run up the stairs. There are two features you should know about skeletal muscle. It's striated and it's voluntary. Striated means that it looks striped. There is a pattern of light and dark lines across the tissue formed from the arrangement of the actin and myosin proteins. You can also see multiple or more than one nuclei. Voluntary muscle means that you have control over the movement. You are choosing to contract or relax your muscles and that allows for you to make voluntary movements such as flexing your bicep, jumping on one foot, or running up the stairs. Smooth muscle tissue looks different than skeletal muscle and it performs a different function in the body. The cells are long with ends that narrow down and they contain only a single nucleus. The two features of smooth muscle are opposite skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is not striated and it is involuntary. You can see from the diagram that the fibers do not form the same regular light and dark patterns as skeletal muscle, which is just a difference in how the actin and myosin are organized. In terms of being involuntary, you might be wondering what kind of muscles you don't have control over. Smooth muscle is responsible for all sorts of movements in our body that we don't want to have to think about or be responsible for remembering to do. For example, our entire digestive tract is made up of smooth muscle, which is responsible for moving food through from esophagus to rectum. The final type of muscle tissue is called cardiac muscle, and it is found exclusively in our heart. This type of muscle is striated and involuntary, a different combination than both skeletal and smooth muscle. The cells are long and branch together to form a network, which is actually very important in coordinating the electrical impulses that initiate the heartbeat. The cardiac muscle tissue has a striated or striped appearance with a single nucleus in each cell. Like smooth muscle, cardiac muscle is involuntary, which means that an organism doesn't have to remember to contract the heart. The body takes care of this on its own. The fourth and final type of tissue found in organisms is called nervous tissue, which is necessary for conducting messages throughout the body. Nervous tissue has three functions. First of all, it takes in information from the environment. We call this sensory input. Nerves take in information about sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, temperature, and so forth from sensory organs and transfers that information to the brain. In the diagram, you can see this person taking in visual information about the glass of water. The second function of nervous tissue is integration, the process where the brain perceives the sensory information and works with that information to make decisions and plans. In the diagram, the man would be recognizing the glass of water as something that he can drink and maybe thinking about how he's thirsty and deciding that he should pick up the water and drink it. Finally, the last function of nervous tissue is motor output, where the brain sends out motor commands to muscles in the body in order to carry out actions. In the case of the thirsty man, you can see that he reaches for the glass and moves it upwards to drink the water. What do nerve cells look like? Well, we had the chance to see nerve cells, which are also called neurons, under the microviewer in the lab. They have a cell body, which typically contains the nucleus in most of the organelles. Branching out from the cell body are dendrites, extensions that allow for communication between different cells. Moving away from the cell body in the other direction, some neurons have an axon that will conduct the nerve impulse to the next nerve cell. In Unit 3, you will learn more about the different nerve cells found in the body. Nervous tissue is found throughout the body. The brain and spinal cord, also known as the central nervous system, are made of nervous tissue, but the peripheral nervous system carries information to and from the brain and spinal cord, allowing sensory information to travel in and motor information to travel out. Another important component of nervous tissue are cells called neuroglia, which are support cells that help to nourish and protect neurons. All right, so you might be feeling a little overwhelmed at this point. We've covered quite a bit of new material. Don't forget that you only need to focus on knowing the four types of tissues, the functions each perform in the body, and examples of each. 
Could you stop this video now and list functions and examples of the four types? Remember, epithelial tissue covers and protects both inside and outside the body. Examples include the skin or glands. Connective tissue binds and connects parts of the body, so examples could include tendons, bones, and even blood. Muscle tissue contracts and allows for movement. Examples include skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. Finally, nervous tissue conducts messages throughout your body, and it can be found in nerves or in your brain. Please take some time to review the types of tissues before class. Before moving on to the rest of the lesson, I'd like to stop and talk a little about one application of understanding cells and tissues. When we talk about cancer, we are really talking about cells of a particular tissue that have started to divide uncontrollably. In the top part of the diagram on the screen, you can see the process of normal cell division in the body. When we need to grow or repair damaged cells, our cells divide. Typically, this can only happen a set number of times before a cell undergoes apoptosis, or programmed cell death. In cancer, a mutated cell divides without any checks in place. It divides without end, producing more and more cells with the same mutation. In fact, normal cells in a petri dish will only divide until they run out of space, but cancer cells continue to divide and pile up on one another even once the space is run out, which is how a tumor can form. Cancers are classified according to the cells that they come from. For example, you may have heard the term carcinoma, which is a cancer of the epithelial cells, or sarcoma, which is a cancer of the muscle or connective tissue. Examples of carcinomas are breast cancer, skin cancer, lung cancer, or colon cancer, while sarcomas might be leukemia, which is cancer of the blood, lymphoma, or bone cancer. You will learn more about some of these diseases as we make our way through the course. Because cancers are spread through cells dividing and passing mutations on to the next generation of cells, it is logical that cancers occur most commonly in the types of cells that divide most rapidly. For example, you can see in the information provided, one of the cells with the shortest lifespans is a bone marrow cell that produces blood cells. They only last about 10 hours before being replaced. White blood cells and skin cells must also be replaced fairly often. Leukemia, a cancer of the blood, and skin cancer are the two most common types of cancers. Because the cells must divide frequently, there is just more of a chance that they will undergo a mutation and begin to divide uncontrollably. If you are interested in reading a little more about how a particular strand of cancer cells, called, called HeLa cells, have come to be used in research and the pharmaceutical industry, you might be interested in a book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebe Rebecca Skloot. This is a biography about how a sample of cancer cells were taken without permission from an African-American woman in the 1950s and how they're still being used by scientists today.